can you guys uh, move a little bit that side <laughs> and can you guys move a little bit this side perfect has everyone received the information sheet for the course you haven't okay I think I gave you several Do you have extra? Thank you. Oh. Anyone else? Okay, so I guess uh, we'll get started. Uh, welcome to EC5759. I hope. Uh, all of you are here for optimization and not for some other class. Uh, this is a, perhaps this, is, this would be your one of the first graduate courses. So, uh, you know, in undergraduate courses, the way teaching happens is very easy, but that's not the case with graduate courses. This is a 5,000 level course, so don't expect it to be easy. Uh, the goal of this course is to use tools from linear algebra and calculus to uh, do numerical optimization. We'll learn almost one algorithm every week, not every week, but in every class. And we'll understand the convergence properties. We'll understand some of the theoretical properties of that particular algorithm. And what it can do, where it will fail, things like that. Uh, and, and that's pretty much uh, what we will do in the course. We will cover both static as well as dynamic optimization. And uh, as you can see, the list of topics are on the second page. Um, we'll do a little bit of modeling, uh, and then we'll talk about gradient methods. We'll talk about several variants of gradient methods. And then we'll talk about uh, some non-gradient optimization. We'll spend considerable amount of time on constrained optimization and talk about duality and convex programming. And then we'll move on to dynamic programming and approximate dynamic programming methods. So it's going to be a very intense course. I don't know how many of you have taken feedback from people who have taken this course before. So those of you who have talked to people who have taken this course before, can you please raise your hands? OK, only a few. Uh, OK, so, so I think if you know someone who has taken this course before, I think you should go and take the feedback. Uh, a very non-biased feedback about this particular course uh, because uh, many people who do not have good background and good handle on linear algebra tend to struggle in this course a lot. So my suggestion to you would be uh, if, if you don't have good background in linear algebra and calculus that within the first week I'm going to cover a few things from linear algebra but you should go back and start brushing up your linear algebra and calculus. Um, as soon as possible, okay? Uh, two weeks into the class, you won't have any idea what's going on if your linear algebra is rusty. So I don't want anyone to go through that uh, experience. There'll be six homeworks, one quiz. The quiz will be on linear algebra and calculus. And we'll have two midterms and one project. There is no final exam for this course. Uh, I used to conduct final exams earlier, but then people told me, I mean, I got feedback that there's just too much syllabus for one final exam. So I said, okay, fine, I'll have three exams throughout the semester, so that way you will have smaller portions for each of the exam. Uh, the project is supposed to be a term paper, so you can write three or four page report on some specific topic in optimization that you really love, or some application that you really like and how optimization is useful for that particular application. Uh, the project report would be due on December 2nd, uh, 2019, so that's pretty much the end of the semester. So you can think of project as your final exam, but it'll be graded based on what you have done and what report you have written and so on. Um, the prerequisite for this class is 3050. Now, if you go online and you check about this class, then the prerequisite written on the university website is 3551. But internally, our department has removed this uh, requirement, but it hasn't gone through the entire university system, which is actually a very long process. But 
It hasn't gone through that process, so still online it shows 3551 as one of the prerequisite, but that's not the prerequisite. So if you have friends who want to get into this class, but who thought that 3551 is a prerequisite, you can inform them that that's not the case and they can take this class without any problem. Uh, I probably will have to sign up, uh, sign on a sheet which says that I'm waiving the prerequisite for this class. So that's, that's fine, I can do that. Uh, Homework policy, you are supposed to submit your own uh, uh, homework. Uh, you can, there's no group assignment in this particular class. And I'm expecting you will write your own homework with your own hands and you will not just copy and paste it from someone else's homework. Um, homeworks would be 30% of the grade. Okay. Office hours, yeah. So my office is 464 Dries Lab. Uh, the office hours are Monday 4.15 to 5.30 p.m. and Friday 11 a.m. to 12 noon. Uh, this is a joint office hour, so I'm also teaching EC3551 this semester, which is a feedback controls class. So you can come in any one of these two office hours, okay? It gives you more options uh, whenever you want to come uh, for office hours. So we can discuss, we can go over assignments, we can go over uh, any problem you may have uh, within this class. The course text is nonlinear programming. You don't have to buy it, but I wanted to show you what the book looks like. Uh, uh, this course is not a required, uh, this uh, book is not a required text for this course, but certainly if you plan on doing optimization for the rest of your lives, and I can guarantee that 60% of this class will be doing optimization for the rest of your lives, um, you should have a copy of this book. Uh, it's a very good book, very nice book on optimization. Um, this is the third edition, but uh, the official text is second edition, so we haven't changed the official text yet uh, for this particular class. Any questions? Oh, the other thing is this class is going to get recorded. So like last year's, last two years, I've been recording this class. So in fact, you don't have to come to the class. You can just go to YouTube and by the end of this weekend, you will be done with the class, okay? <laughs> because all the 40 lectures are on YouTube from the last two years. Uh, but I still want to record the class because sometimes uh, some of the concepts are not very well described in the previous classes. So you can have another video for similar concepts. So, um, but yeah, as far as uh, attending the classroom is concerned, attendance is not compulsory. I will have to take attendance for the first week, but I won't be taking attendance after next Wednesday onwards, okay? So if you want to come to the class, you can come to the class. If you want to look at video while you are cooking or, I don't know, running, you can do that. <laughs> uh, it's possible. However, of course, coming to the class is the most important thing you can ever do in your life, so uh, I would expect every one of you to attend the class. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes. Oh. Okay, so let's go through attendance really quick, and then we can get started. Uh, Mohammed, Yaz, uh, Mubarak, Vijay, Arvin, Brian. Stephen, how? Here, Ziki, Ziki Shen, Joseph, Justin, Justin, Surajit, Akshat, Agnib. Katie, Andrew, Sai, Varun, Weying, 
वेइंग गु बालाजी साकेत जिंग जिंगोंग जेनिफर कार्तिक सुनजुंग सियोनो नाकेयोंग जुअर प्रणव Omar I think I saw him yeah Vinith Sara Saheb Bo Jianzong Sir Mahavir Aaron Aaron Sargent I have heard this name before Saurabh, yeah. Tianhao, Harnarayan Singh, Yuvraj, Brennan, Stu, Hassan, Lucian, Alex, Jingyu, Pavan, Harika, Han Wong. Okay, good. That's done. What's your name? When did you register? Did you register long time back, or did you register for the class last night? When? Long time back? Uh, we can perhaps look at your name after the class is over. About you? Okay. Okay. So those of you who have registered like maybe in the last one or two days, your name may not have appeared in the roster yet. So it might appear in a couple of days. Take some time to, for the names to appear here. Okay. So why is optimization important? So optimization has been used, well, what's the history of optimization? So optimization has been around for many decades now, but the major push to optimization happened around World War II. So a lot of things in control theory and in general in this area, electrical and computer engineering area, they all happened around World War II, uh, partly because Everything needed to be optimized, everything needed to be automatic, everything needed to be precise, and that's when the field got a huge push. So early development and optimization happened on linear programming methods, and we are going to cover linear programming methods in this class. Um, and then later on in 1940s and 50s, dynamic optimization methods were developed, and we'll talk about dynamic programming and maximum principle in this class, uh, which are dynamic uh, methods for dynamic optimization. And then uh, 1960s onwards, optimization went mainstream with a uh, huge number of applications in signal processing. Um, so if you look at how images are processed or how signals in general are processed in modern systems, they all have some underlying optimization technique that's running in the background, okay? Um, Nowadays, there is huge emphasis on reduction of CO2, which is why optimization is again playing a central role in these, uh, in these contexts, because if you look at modern vehicles, they are way more fuel efficient than what, uh, what was the, than the vehicles in 1960s and 1970s, and the reason for that is Besides, of course, there has been a lot of research on how to better manage the engine and some new sort of catalyst converters and so on, which can reduce emissions from the car. But besides that, of course, a lot of work has also gone into optimizing how much fuel to inject, what should be the optimal ratio of air versus fuel in the car, and how 
to better manage the whole engine performance in order to minimize the CO2 emissions. And similar, uh, uh, so airline operations are optimized uh, in order to maximize the revenue, minimize the cost, and make sure people can get from point A to point B. Uh, they are very, very difficult, complicated optimization problems, which uh, uh, we will not study their theory in this particular class, but they are all part of advanced optimization techniques that may be covered in some other class in the university. I'm not aware of uh, classes like that. Uh, communication systems are also using optimization to uh, devise transmission or encoding or decoding or receiving policies in order to maximize throughput in communication systems, so the number of messages you can send within a second or within a time period, um, and to also minimize the delay, uh, which, is, uh, which is also important. So you, whenever the information gets generated, you want to get the information as soon as possible, and it cannot happen if you look at the system as a whole and design transmission and communication policies which are optimized for performance based on the physical constraints of that particular uh, of that particular overall communication system. So, so these are some very basic examples where optimization is useful. But of course, as the course progress and through the course project, that is uh, one of the components of this class. Uh, I am expecting that you will discover more applications of optimization, and you will study in greater depth why optimization is, I mean, how do you, given a problem, how do you actually figure out which algorithm to use in order to solve that problem, solve that optimization problem, and um, what are the performance of those algorithms? Can you use them in real-time systems? Can you use them, do you have to use supercomputers in order to solve them? Things of that nature, so. Uh, as this course progress, you will get to hear more and more about different techniques in optimization. The crux of optimization lies in two disparate fields in mathematics. So one is linear algebra, and the other is calculus. So what we are going to do in the first week, which is Wednesday, Friday, and next Monday, we will do a very quick review of uh, sequences, series, uh, matrices, determinants, symmetric matrices, uh, and uh, convex sets, convex functions, differentiation of convex sets, convex, uh, differentiation of convex functions, and uh, what else? And some, uh, and, and things like implicit function theorem and inverse function theorem, those are very important topics. Uh, and we won't cover the proof of some of these results, or most of these results, we won't cover the proof. And I don't expect you to be familiar with the proofs, uh, but it would be helpful if you can go back and read the book or read some other source for getting a deeper understanding of some of those ideas. Uh, for most of the linear algebra and calculus stuff, the proofs are usually covered in your undergrad classes, undergrad math classes. So you must have seen the proof in one form of another, one form or another, in your undergrad class. So hopefully that shouldn't be a problem. Okay. So I'm going to start with uh, Euclidean spaces and norms over Euclidean spaces, and this is all just the review for what you probably already know. I'm guessing many of you will get bored in the first three classes, but later on things will become more exciting. So x is in Rn. So norm on x, which is denoted by xq, is I pick q greater than or equal to 1. Summation of xi raised to q cute square root, okay? So this is the Q norm. Some examples are Euclidean norm.
which is x transpose x. Then one norm and then infinity norm. Okay, yes. Is Q, number, or Q is greater than or equal to one. Q is a real number. Yeah, so it doesn't need to be a natural number. Or it could also be infinity, of course, because I've defined infinity norm. Okay. Are you able to see it now? Okay. So there is a famous result about norms or on Euclidean spaces. So it's known as Schwartz inequality, which says that if I pick x, y in R n and I pick PQ greater than or equal to 1 such that 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to 1, then absolute value of X transpose Y is upper bounded by Pth norm of X and Qth norm of y. Okay, is this visible on this side? Somewhat? Okay. <laughs> you know, my problem is if I write something here, then people in the front cannot see it. And if I write things on the side, then people on the other side of the classroom cannot see it. This is not a good classroom for blackboard based teaching. And this is the highest form of technology I use in classroom setting. <laughs> uh, okay. Any questions on Schwartz inequality? No? Okay. So when do you have equality here? Well, you have equality only if x is a, so equality if and only if x equals to alpha y for some natural number alpha. Not natural, some real number alpha. Okay. Next, I'm going to talk about sequences. Is everyone familiar with the notion of a sequence? Right? So I have XK, which is a sequence. K goes from 1 to X. 1 to infinity, this is a sequence in Rn, okay, so a sequence of vectors. And we say that xk converges to x bar as k goes to infinity if and only if for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists a natural number n epsilon such that 
norm of xk minus x bar is less than epsilon for all n greater than or equal to n epsilon. Okay. So let's see what is happening. I have a point x bar. I have a sequence. So this is my x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and so on. And this sequence converges to this particular point x bar. What that means is if I look at an epsilon ball around x bar, so this is my epsilon ball. There exists a natural number such that the tail of the sequence is within this ball for all numbers greater than that particular natural number. Okay, so let's say this was my x6, no, x6, x7, x8, x9, and so x10 onwards, all the points are, the entire tail is within this epsilon ball. And if I make my epsilon smaller, this natural number n epsilon is going to increase, okay? So that's what it means for a sequence to converge to a point x bar. Why is this notion important for algorithms? So this course is on algorithms, right? We are going to study algorithms for optimization. Why is this concept important? Convergence, right? So you want your algorithm to converge to some point Okay, you don't want your algorithm, so you, run an you have an optimization problem, you run an algorithm, you don't want the algorithm to spit out not a number after all the calculation is complete. You want it to spit out a number. And as we will see, that by carefully tuning parameters in the optimization, you can either make it converge or you can make it diverge. Okay, we'll see it both theoretically as well as through examples in assignments. So that's why the notion of convergence of sequences is extremely important in optimization, uh, in the theory of optimization. Professor, yes. Is it for all n equal or greater than n epsilon or for all k? Oh, k. Thank you. I'm going to make these mistakes so as to see if you guys are sleeping or not. Okay. So he's not sleeping, but others I don't know. Okay, uh, there's another very nice theorem about convergence of sequence. So xk, k equals one to infinity, the sequence in Rn and it is bounded. Okay, which means norm of xk is less than equal to m for all k in n. Then there exists a convergent subsequence x and k or x k n n equals one to infinity, which converges to some x bar. Okay, so this is my R2. I have this big ball of radius M. 
and I have a sequence that is entirely within this ball. What this theorem suggests is if the sequence is bounded, you can extract a convergent subsequence from this particular sequence. So a sequence is of course written as x1, x2, x3 and so on. A convergent subsequence would look like x1, x5, x100, x101, x102, x1000 and so on. Okay, so this is a subsequence. This is the original sequence you started with. You extracted a subsequence which is converging to x bar. Okay, so this one is going to converge to x bar. A very powerful result. And what this says is there exists at least one convergent subsequence. Okay, you could have multiple convergent subsequences within this original sequence that you started with. So let's see through an example. So this is my axis K. This is my R. And I have a sequence which is of the form of a triangular wave. Okay, so this is my X1 x2, x3, x4, okay. Now, I want to, so this is, this is a bounded sequence because everything is within this bound, okay. Everything is within this bound. So it's a bounded sequence. Can you extract a convergent subsequence from this particular bounded sequence? Yes. X1, 2, 4, 6, 8. Okay, so one convergent subsequence is X2, X4, X6, X8. This converges to what? Zero. Right? Let's say this is one and this is minus one. And then there was another convergent subsequence, Omar. One, one five, nine, x one, x five, x nine, x thirteen, which converges to one. And similarly, x three, x seven, and so on, that converges to negative one. Okay? So every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. Okay? That's this. That's what this theorem suggests. If every convergent subsequence, so if you have a bounded sequence and every convergent subsequence converges to the same point, then the sequence itself is convergent to that particular point. Okay? So Corollary, if any xnk converges to x bar, then xk converges to x bar. So you pick any convergent subsequence which converges to x bar, then your original sequence also converges to x bar. That's a corollary to this particular theorem. Any questions? Yes? How will we be applying these theorems in optimization? Very good. So we come up with an algorithm. Uh, and then I ask you whether this algorithm is going to converge or not. Okay, so the algorithm is going to take input as x1. It will spit out x2. You feed it back x2. It will spit out x3 and so on. And my question to you would be whether this algorithm actually converges or not. And as we will see, both through examples as well as we'll see it in a few days from now, uh, 
by picking appropriate parameters that are used within that optimization algorithm, you can actually force an algorithm to converge or you can force an algorithm to diverge, okay? So that's where we will use some of these results for proving that it will converge no matter what. Okay? Now next in line is continuous function. When do we say that a function is continuous? You know, one difficulty that some of you may have is you have learned everything in the context of real line and now I'm introducing things in the context of Euclidean spaces. But the beauty of math is that nothing changes if you go from single dimensional space to higher dimensional space. So in fact, even if this n was one million or one billion, the result still holds, okay, nothing changes. So that's the beauty of uh, using abstractions for uh, solving problems. So f is a function from Rn to R, is said to be continuous if and only if y converges to x implies fy converges to fx. Uh, I want to say that for all x. So pick any sequence that converges to x. The corresponding function value will also converge to the function value at x. And this will hold throughout no matter which x you pick in Rn. Okay. So the example of discontinuous functions would be any function that has a jump. Okay, if there is no jump in the function, the function is continuous. Okay. We will not talk about matrices. So I pick a matrix A which is uh, which has n cross n number of entries. So A is symmetric if A equals A transpose. Okay, so this is the definition of a symmetric matrix. So if I have zero, 5, 5, 1. I take the transpose, that's also 0, 5, 5, 1. Okay, so it's a symmetric matrix. So every matrix A has a thing called characteristic polynomial which is determinant of lambda i minus A where lambda is a complex number. Okay. What are the roots of this characteristic polynomial called? Eigenvalues, right? So roots are lambda one all the way to lambda n. So this is a, uh, this polynomial is of degree n, therefore it has n roots in the complex plane. So it may not have real roots, but it will have complex roots. And those n complex roots are known as eigenvalues of A, okay? 
So what happens at eigenvalues of a? My determinant of lambda i is equal to 0, which means there exists a vector vi such that lambda i identity matrix minus a vi is equal to 0. Okay, because the determinant is equal to 0, it means that uh, it means that this matrix has rank less than n, and therefore you can always find a vector vi, which could be a complex vector, such that the, this matrix multiplied by the vector is equal to 0. And then vi is called eigenvector, right? Eigenvector corresponding to corresponding to lambda i, OK? OK? So this is something that I'm assuming everyone is familiar with. So this is not a new thing. The eigenvalue, so all eigenvalues are in complex plane, so they certainly have a magnitude and they have a phase. Uh, if I, let me erase this stuff. So spectral radius rho of A is max over i, absolute value of lambda i. So you figure out what the roots of A is, find out what the maximum magnitude is of all the eigenvalues, and then that's the spectral radius of the matrix A. A classical result is, let me call it claim because it's not difficult to prove. So a raised to k goes to 0 if and only if rho of a is less than 1. So if the spectral radius of the matrix is less than 1, and you keep multiplying the matrix again and again, it goes to 0. Any question so far? Okay, so very soon we will start using these ideas for studying optimization methods. So if you feel that these are claims that are difficult to follow, you should definitely go back and read some book on, op on linear algebra and calculus, whichever one you used for your undergrad degree. Yes. Good point. Uh, they are, but it's just one of the norms. Yeah, but not uh, well. They are related, but you cannot use well. So let's look at this matrix. Zero, one, zero, zero. It's not a zero matrix, right? But the spectral radius is equal to zero for this particular matrix, okay? So you can't necessarily call, use this as a notion of norm, but it has some meaning. Uh, for symmetric matrices, uh, I think this would be a kind of a norm because this is the same as maximum singular value of the matrix. So yes, for, for symmetric A, this could be viewed as a norm, but not for not symmetric A. Yes? How does this result come from uh, that for symmetric matrices, this can be the norm? 
Oh, because the spectral radius for a symmetric matrix is the same as maximum singular value of the matrix, and the maximum singular value of the matrix is a two norm, Frobenius norm of a matrix. Okay. Okay. Uh, now I want to introduce the notion of positive definite matrices. So A is symmetric implies lambda 1 to lambda n are real. So symmetric matrices have real eigenvalues. This is a claim. It also turns out, so, uh, so the definition is A is positive definite if lambda 1 all the way to lambda n is greater than 0 and A is symmetric. Okay, so all eigenvalues are positive and A is symmetric, then the matrix A is said to be positive definite matrix. What this also implies is X transpose AX is strictly positive for all X in Rn, X not equal to zero. Okay, so these two are equivalent definitions of positive definite matrices. So A is symmetric and well, you also need to check A is symmetric in this case. So let me add a equals to A transpose. So you need to check A is symmetric in both cases, but you also need to check if all eigenvalues are positive or no matter which X you pick, X transpose AX is strictly positive, um, as long as X is non-zero. Okay, any questions on positive definite matrices? Okay, let's look at a matrix A, which is not a square matrix. So, so far we have been focusing solely on square matrices. Let's spend some time on rectangular matrices. So, your M is not necessarily equal to N. You can't define any of this for matrices of that type. However, one thing that you can define is rank of A, which is equal to the number of number of linearly independent columns of A which is also equal to number of linearly independent rows of A. One minus one, two minus or minus two, two. This matrix sits in a two cross two space, but the rank of the matrix, can someone tell me what the rank is? One. Why one? Because this row 
is two times or negative two times the first row or this column is negative one times the first column. So number of linearly independent columns is just one in this case, which also is equal to the number of linearly independent rows of that matrix. Okay, so A is full rank if rank of A equals to min of M and N. Okay, whenever a matrix is not of full rank, so let's consider this particular matrix, one, minus one, minus two, and two. I can find a vector x such that this is equal to zero, okay? So if A is not full rank, I can always find a vector x such that A multiplied by x is equal to, well, zero, zero. So can someone tell me what should the value of x1 and x2 be in this case? One minus one? No. One, one? Yes. Okay, so if I multiply this matrix with one, one, I get zero. So this x is non-zero, but I still get zero on this side. So that's the property of a not full rank matrix. So full rank is important in some cases. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's talk about differentiation of functions. So we have talked about continuous function before. But we need to have more structure on the function if we want to run some optimization methods. So we need the function to be differentiable in many cases. So I have a function f from rn to r. You define the directional derivative of f as limit alpha goes to zero, f of x plus alpha ei minus f of x over alpha. Ei is the unit vector in ith dimension, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, are all of you familiar with this definition of derivative for functions of multiple variables? Have any of you seen this before? Some of you have, some of you may not have seen this before. So this is known as directional derivative. This is in the direction of EI, which is the ith uh, unit vector. And we denote by this nabla, symbol nabla, so this is nabla f, which is gradient of f. This is del f over del x1, del f over del xn. And this is a vector in Rn, okay? So the function maps Rn to R, but the gradient of f sits in Rn, okay? Yes? Are functions always be mapping to a scalar? Uh, are all functions going to be mapping to? Are we always just going to be developing a function that just maps to a scalar? Well, no, we will also, so for instance, gradient of f maps Rn to Rn. 
Okay? So then you talk about second derivative of f, then you are you will get a matrix, not just a vector. So anyways, I think that we are we are uh, the time is up, so we are going to continue our discussion from there in the next class. We'll talk about second derivative of functions and so on. Thank you, and I'll see you next uh, on on next on Friday.